Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I am Gabe Bowen. I'm an associate professor of geology and geophysics up at the U, um, and I had the pleasure of hosting Scott Wing's uh, visit this week. Um, I'm excited to welcome you to the penultimate Frontiers of Science lecture for this uh, season. Um, really hope you've enjoyed this season this year, or the series this year of lectures. Um, one of the emphases, the fo focuses for the series has been on climate change, and Scott's talk um, uh, today will kind of wrap up that theme for us uh, for the year. Um, we're really lucky to have Scott to, to join us to, to do that. Uh, the final lecture in the series for this year will be in April, and it's going to steer us in a different direction toward immunology and uh, beneficial microbes, and that should be very interesting as well. Uh, now to introduce Scott. Um, Dr. Wing, Scott Wing, was uh, born in New Orleans, and he was uh, raised there and in North Carolina. Um, he developed an interest in fossils uh, in, during his childhood, and uh, that's carried through to today, uh, and got into field work, which is another major passion of his um, while a student at Yale. He received his bachelor's degree there in 1976, which I uh, pointed out to him was a year before I was born, when we were talking earlier. Um, he got his uh, PhD at Yale in 1981 and spent some time working with the U.S. Geological Survey before taking his current position at the Smithsonian Museum um, in 1984. Uh, he's now a curator of paleobotany there. Um, his work centers on fossil plants, on studying the evolution of plants, as well as using plants as indicators for paleoclimate, uh, to understand paleoclimate change. Um, and he also uh, focuses on understanding plants as a part of terrestrial ecosystems uh, in time, uh, how those communities respond to climate change. Uh, he works extensively in the Rocky Mountains, but also is very well traveled throughout the globe and uh, has a nearly exhaustive understanding of uh, plant community change um, throughout the world in the early part of the Cenozoic, a very interesting climate, climatological period that he'll talk about tonight. Um, his talk will focus on a, a specific climate event that happened 56 uh, million years ago, uh, one which I like to call the last great, great global warming, and uh, which I think he'll make the case is potentially instructive as we look forward in uh, the future. Um, Scott has published more than 70 scientific papers. He's edited five books. Uh, he holds adjunct and honorary positions at uh, four different universities. He's a busy guy. He's also a fellow of uh, the Paleontological Society, the Geological Society of America, uh, and last year, or in 2012, he served as a Bass Fellow at the Yale Institute for Biospheric Studies. Um, the other thing Scott does in his spare time, being at the museum, uh, he works with um, curating exhibits and designing exhibits, and he is currently um, on a team that's spearheading renovation of 30,000 square feet of exhibit space at the Smithsonian, um, which will focus on Earth history, um, and uh, climate change and other topics. So with that, uh, I'll step down and I'll give you uh, Scott Wing. Thanks, Gabe. Well, thanks very much, and uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, it's also very pleasant to get out of Washington occasionally, and, and uh, since we had a snowstorm on Sunday, a snowstorm in Washington is, is anything that's more than about four inches of snow, which uh, we exceeded Sunday night, so it was kind of a little exciting to get here. But is this uh, flashing on and off? Yeah, we don't know why. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll have to hope that it, it's uh, not going to disturb things too much. But. Um, so what I'm going to talk about tonight, I'm going to sort of start this presentation uh, in the present day and give you a sense of why somebody might be interested in something that seems as arcane as what happened 56 million years ago. Um, apologies to the geologists in the room who were thinking there's nothing arcane at all about what happened 56 million years ago. Um, and then, so we're going to start in the present sort of as a justification, if you will, uh, then dive back into the past, uh, talk a little bit about this this uh, strange uh, global warming event that happened 56 million years ago. And then I want to come back up and talk about what I think it means, which is very definitely the squishy part of the talk, uh, the part that I understand the least well. And uh, I'll be interested maybe in getting some thoughts from you about, about what it means. Comments uh, welcomed. 
So this is something that probably most of you are, are pretty well aware of if you're here uh, for a talk about anything scientific and involving climate change. This is the historical record of temperature and CO2 going back to 1860 uh, with some projections for uh, where uh, we might end up by 2100 um, in terms of carbon dioxide and increase in global temperature over this reference period. And it's pretty clear uh, from these records that first of all, we, we are already uh, out of the historic window of CO2 levels in the atmosphere and that we've already seen some warming of the Earth's surface and the physics of that are pretty well understood. Um, and it's also clear that things are going to get uh, we're going to have more CO2 in the atmosphere, and we're going to have a warmer planet in the future. And so if you're a, an, a paleontologist and a relatively simple-minded kind of person, you think, well, if there's no precedent for the future in the recent past, maybe we should just add some more past onto this. So I'm going to slide that whole record back um, into the right wall there. And it's now collapsed. This is the 1850 to 2100 period. And the only th thing I have to tell you is that this little tiny bar here is may maybe 10 or 20 times or 50 times wider than it should be. Uh, so I've taken a little liberty there. Uh, and these are the projections instead of illustrating all the different pathways, which are essentially straight vertical lines here. I'm just showing you a bar for various projections for increased global temperature and increased CO2 levels from um, actually the fourth IPCC report. Um, but this is now a record that's 800,000 years long, and it comes from uh, bubbles in, in ice cores. And it shows the track of, of CO2 change and temperature change over the last 800,000 years. And you can see these seesaws that are, uh, that are showing you glacial interglacial uh, cycles. So it, there are times when it's been colder and times when it's been warmer and times when there's been more CO2 and less CO2 that, that correspond to those warmings and coolings uh, uh, fairly closely. And you can see that we're, we're heading out of that window. So uh, this simple idea that, that you might have, well, if you don't see a historical precedent for where we're headed, add some time onto the back of it. Uh, it doesn't seem to work because we're, we're headed out of the window of the last 800,000 years of Earth history, which is a, a sobering thought in itself. But um, since you're still a simple-minded paleontologist in this example, you think, oh, well, we just need to add some more history on. So now we're going to slide <laughs> the 800,000-year history into um, this little bit right here, and we still are holding on to our reference period. And now we're looking at the last 65, 66 million years. And uh, there's no ice on the planet that's old enough to hold that record. So we're now looking at a record that comes from the deep sea. It's been cored by ships like this one. Here's a section of core. Is anybody, uh, nobody's going to have a, a problem with the flickering screen? Uh, making, I hope not. Um, doesn't disturb your, your visual system or anything. Disturbs mine a little bit, but, um, but I'm closer to the screen than you are. So. Anyway, the, the, the record comes from the shells of these little foraminifera um, that uh, record in their chemical composition, in their isotopic composition, the temperature of the bottom of the ocean. And so that's how this record is built up. Uh, the CO2 record for over that long period of time is much less well known, so you get these big blue bars when you, inc when you include all of the the estimates of CO2 that have been made. But and, and it's this record that actually gets you to a precedent for where we're headed in the next 100 years or so, or, or more than that. So you, you basically have to go back uh, 20 million years to get to where we think we might be in 2100. Uh, we're already um, have, have sort of gone into the Pliocene. So this is, this is instead of back to the future, this is back to the, or the future is forward to the past instead of back to the future. Um, and so we're already back a f maybe a couple million years, and, and it looks like we're headed back maybe 20 million. And if we actually um, burn 
uh, most of the fossil fuel reservoir, we, we, could, we could get ourselves back to a, a more Eocene-like climate, which means that these distant parts of Earth history uh, are maybe more relevant than, than we might think, or we certainly more relevant than I thought when I started doing this work as a grad student uh, a long time ago, before Gabe was born. So let's take a look at this and um, think about this planet. This planet uh, of 56 million years ago, it's not a planet that's radically different from the planet we live on today. Uh, North America looks like North America. South America looks like South America. Uh, Australia is maybe disturbingly far uh, south towards Antarctica, and India hasn't collided fully with Asia yet. But um, it's, not a, it's not a world where everything is foreign and unfamiliar to us. The thing that's, that's really the most different is the climate. And uh, that's kind of symbolized by uh, this photograph, which is a, a picture of a uh, fossil forest at about 80 degrees north latitude on Axel Heiberg Island uh, in the Canadian Arctic. And this is a stump of a Don Redwood, a metasequoia tree. And these are more of the same and this forest is estimated to have had the productivity of a modern day uh, coniferous rainforest, say, on the coast of British Columbia. And this is the modern day vegetation of this area, these little bright spots of yellow flowers. So this is obviously um, a really different planet in terms of its climate uh, with much, much warmer poles than we have today. And that's kind of symbolized uh, by this photograph, um, which, uh, shows this gentleman here uh, who lives in the Arctic holding a photograph of, of uh, Okefenokee Swamp, which we think is a, not a bad analog for what the Arctic would have uh, been like climatically and vegetationally 50 million years ago. The other thing that's really uh, surprisingly different and difficult to explain is that, that back during this period of time, this very warm period in the early Cenozoic, um, we also had much warmer winters in continental interiors. So the kind of uh, very strong seasonal fluctuations in temperature that we're used to today in the middle of a large continent like North America uh, were damped out. And you have um, you know, beautiful fossils from Utah of uh, leaves from the Green River Shales. This is, this is a palm leaf, obviously. And uh, it just shows you that, that the winters here could not possibly have been um, as cold as they are today, because plants like this don't tolerate frozen ground. And, and to symbolize that, I have a uh, cheerful, I'm from New Orleans, as Gabe said, and, and I don't like cold weather. Uh, and somebody persuaded me to go to Wyoming in February uh, <laughs> to have this photograph taken. And the smile, I assure you, is not genuine, but it, this is. <laughs> But, but the, they thought that the alligator was really going to help uh, convey the message that, that the ancient uh, landscape here was very different from the, or the ancient climate here was very different from the modern climate. So what I want to talk about is, is really, uh, we've just you know, sort of touched the, the, uh, the tip of this topic here, this long period that's really hard to explain in climate models, uh, the, the kinds of simulations that people do of future climate. Um, it's very hard to explain how you keep the world this warm at the poles and this warm in the continental interiors. Um, it's, it's, it's a problem that, that the community that studies paleoclimate is still working on. But, but wrapped in or embedded in this enigma, there's an even more curious little riddle um, this, this 56 million year warming event that's called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. And I, I hope you'll allow me, um, since I'm from Washington and I lo love acronyms, to call the PETM because it's, it's quicker. So um, the PETM is this very short period. And what I'm going to do now is basically um, expand the horizontal axis on this graph enormously and just give you a sense of uh, a little bit of the structure within that spike. Um, and this is what it looks like in um, terms of carbon isotopes and temperature inferred um, from uh, deep marine cores. So this is, again, using that same 
uh, source of information that we reconstructed the whole uh, 65 million year um, temperature record from. And it just occurred to me, I wonder if this is just a loose connection at my end. That's why they can't fix it. It's my fault. Okay, so um, this, this is in white a curve showing uh, the carbon isotope composition. So this is the ratio of carbon 12 to carbon 13 to stable isotopes of carbon. And you get an, a big shift in that ratio um, at the onset of this event that is coincident with this rise in temperature that's recorded in the, in the red line here. And the significance of that is that this is telling us that a very large amount of carbon was released into the ocean and atmosphere system um, and that it was light carbon. So it was a lot of carbon-12. And right with that change in carbon isotope ratio and temperature, there's also a change in the nature of deep sea sediments in many places. And here you're looking, I guess that wasn't the problem. Um, here you're looking at, at a core uh, that's composed of, of chalk and you're seeing sections of core. This was once you know, a continuous column of rock, and, but uh, starting older at this far end and coming up, and then this, this piece here would have been on the bottom there, so you read it up this way. And you're coming up through the very last part of the Paleocene, uh, and you come up to the very end of the Paleocene, and suddenly at the onset of this PETM event, the rocks turn red instead of white, and there's no carbonate in there. So what we have is basically dissolution of carbonate in the deep ocean. Um, you may have heard about ocean acidification. Well, this is, this is an example of um, the ocean water becoming or able to, to dissolve um, the, CO, the, uh, the chalk at the, at the, uh, in the lower part of the ocean here. So we have several pieces of evidence that I've just, just shown you. We have this global warming, which we can, um, we can estimate the magnitude of and have estimates actually from many places now of four to eight degrees Celsius or seven to 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we have uh, dissolution of deep ocean chalk deposits in many parts of the world ocean. We have this shift in the carbon isotope ratio um, that we can detect in many different kinds of substances, both in the ocean and on land. And the, and we see that the duration of this event is about 200,000 years long. And the conclusion from these, these uh, lines of evidence is that what we're seeing is uh, in a few millennia, uh, the release of something between 4,000 and 7,000 billion tons of carbon, which is an amount of carbon that's roughly equivalent to or perhaps even more than the amount of carbon that's left in fossil fuel reservoirs today. So the event 56 million years ago starts to have some uh, almost eerie resonances with, with, uh, with what's happening now as a result of, of human activities. The first thing that you're, you're gonna wanna know is where did, uh, where did the carbon come from? And uh, this event's been known for about 20 years now and uh, we still haven't got a definitive answer to that question. Uh, there are a number of potential sources for the carbon. Uh, it's been suggested that um, there are uh, methane hydrate deposits. There are methane hydrate deposits in the bottom of the ocean today um, where uh, methane, instead of being released as, as a gas, is actually trapped in a cage of water molecules. And um, that's one possible source for the carbon. Another possible source is burning of peat deposits. This is a, a photograph of um, Indonesian uh, peat deposits in a big El Nino year uh, on fire. And uh, it would have required burning of peat and shallowly buried coal to, to generate enough carbon to make the dissolution and the, and the change in climate and uh, carbon isotope ratio that we see to explain um, all those together, you, if you burned every stick of vegetation on the surface of the earth 56 million years ago, there probably would not have been enough to, to, um, to generate the magnitude of the event that we see. So we think it would have had to have, um, if it came from terrestrial sources, it would have had to have burned into, the, into peat and shallowly buried coal deposits. It's also possible that we're seeing um, carbon that was liberated 
from volcanic activity. This is a period when uh, Scandinavia is actively rifting from Greenland in the North Atlantic, and it's possible that volcanic activity might have intruded into carbon-rich or organic carbon-rich marine sediments in that area. And it's also possible that we're seeing uh, some effect of, of oxidation of permafrost deposits. Um, presumably it must have been in Antarctica because we think in the, in the north it wouldn't have been cold enough to, um, to have much permafrost. But we can't, re at this point we don't know uh, whether one of these sources is the primary source, but there's a lot of evidence that's, that's beginning to point to more than one uh, reservoir of carbon being released during this event. And <clears throat> the, uh, the event is known from many places around the world. These stars here are places where we have it on land, and the circles, uh, places where we have it in marine cores. But I'm going to focus on this area here because since I'm interested in terrestrial organisms, um, and this is the place where the event is best known in terrestrial uh, rocks. And it's the Bighorn Basin in northwestern Wyoming. Um, and this is what it looks like today, obviously. Um, the Bighorn Mountains back here, which were rising uh, during this period of time and shedding sediment into a basin that was subsiding and trapping uh, sediment. So we have rivers that were eroding the mountains, which were probably not uh, snow-covered and not high um, back then, coming down into the basin, depositing sediments on broad, relatively flat floodplains, um, and these red bands are fossil soil horizons that formed on those. And I've spent uh, um, a long time in the Bighorn Basin looking for fossil plant deposits. And a lot of times when I'm talking with people, they want to know, well, how do you find fossil plants? Um, and the answer is that it's, it is a very um, low-tech process that involves a lot of literally wandering around in the Badlands. And if you like, if you like deserts and Badlands, and this is a, a really fun thing to do. So, um, th this is me with, with a shovel and, and, you know, and people who are also with shovels. And, and you, you, you wander, you can't see into rocks, and plant fossils don't usually weather out of rocks. So in order to know if there are any plant fossils in there, you have to actually dig a hole. Um, and of course, you dig small holes until you have some reason to think that, um, that you have something. And so if you find some rocks that might be kind of brown colored with organic matter in them, you might dig a, a somewhat bigger hole. And if, if you start to find pieces of rock, you might get your, your friends together and dig a bigger hole. <laughs> and if you, uh, if you keep at that for a while, you, uh, you can end up with a, actually a pretty big hole considering it was dug by people with shovels and picks. This is, this is actually my, this is my very favorite hole in the ground ever. <laughs> Um, it, it's, it's visible on Google Earth if you know exactly where to look. Uh, it, it's, a, it's about one pixel on the, go on the Google Earth image. And um, this, this is the place, this is the first place where I found reasonably good um, fossils from the PETM uh, after looking for, I think it's actually 14 years for for the, so wandering in the Badlands for, for a long time, which might have resonance for some people, um, and, and, uh, and looking for, for fossils of just exactly this age. And the day I found this, I, I was with, with a student who had never been to the field before, and um, it was his first day in the field, and we, were, we had been out and it was, it was really hot because it was summer and it's always hot there in the summer. And um, it, was, it was well past lunchtime. I think it was about three o'clock in the afternoon. And we were, we, I finally realized that he had run out of water and that we should go back to the car to get him some food and some, some water before he passed out in the sun. And we were coming back over a hill, headed toward the vehicle. And I said, oh, let me just you know, check this spot and dug in with a shovel and out popped a bunch of fossils. 
And, and the weird thing was I knew immediately because of having spent so long looking that these were different from the fossils that came before and after, and therefore this must be what I had been looking for for the last 14 years. And so, and I was kneeling on the ground and I was digging with the shovel and I started laughing because it was just, it was just seemed so amusing that, that you would know from the first moment that, that, that these were the things that you've been looking for. And then the emotion of happiness sort of overcame me and I started crying. And so I'm, I was kneeling on the ground laughing and crying. <laughs> And then I remembered that the guy who was with me had no idea <laughs> and was probably, and then he was probably thinking, I don't know where the car is. <laughs> so so, so I, I, I explained to him that, that I had been looking for these fossils since he was uh, like eight years old. And, and I, I think that reassured him a little. He never came back. So. <laughs> Anyway, so this, this, is, this, is, this is a wonderful hole in the ground. It has yielded many fossils that look kind of like this. Um, and typically, you know, when we find nice fossils, we wrap them up in, in this really high-tech material that we order from janitorial supply companies <laughs> and, and take it back to the Smithsonian where we use really high-tech equipment like this binocular microscope to, um, to, to look at them. So it's, it's from start to finish, this is nothing but, but the latest technology. <laughs> um, but but with, a, with enough time, you can put a lot of holes in the ground in a lot of places, and this is uh, a chunk of my field area in the Bighorn Basin, uh, a couple hundred places where we've collected uh, that represent a total of uh, seven million years and a lot of different kinds of plants. And this is a, a sort of slightly different way of displaying um, the information, but uh, this is these, each of these little crosses represents a, a, a fossil plant locality uh, placed at its estimated age in millions of years ago. And so they're in this interval um, of about a million years that has the PETM in the middle of it. Um, you can see that there are something like 100 sites. Um, and there, there are some gaps in the record, but we actually know something about what kinds of plants lived in this area across this period of time. And this abbreviation here, CIE, is the carbon isotope excursion. The body of the carbon isotope excursion is the period of most extreme climatic warming. And this is this recovery phase here is when the carbon isotope composition of the atmosphere and the ocean starts to return uh, to its previous state. So we can actually line up um, the species ranges in time. So each of these lines now represents um, a record uh, of uh, when a species of plant occurred through time. And for some reason, it's missing part of it. But anyway, this is um, these each of these 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 vertical lines is 100,000 years, and here's the onset of the of the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum. And we have different kinds of of we can sort of categorize the ranges of these plant species in different ways. We have some uh, that, are, that come right up. They're common through uh, millions of years before the event. They come up close to the end of that period of time, and then they're not seen in the PETM or after the PETM. So those are plant species that may have gone extinct, either regionally extirpated or have gone, gone globally extinct. Uh, at the time of the PETM. There are also plants that we see that are found only in the PETM. And so with um, many years of collecting, we have lots and lots of sites that are Paleocene sites and lots of sites that are Eocene sites. And we've never found these species in any of those sites. We only find them during this period of, glo of globally warm climate. So these are these are species that we think immigrated into the Bighorn Basin uh, during the PETM. We also have a, we have a few species that, that seem to go right through. They don't really care uh, about the PETM. They're before, during, and after. Then we have another group of species that appears um, at, as the event fades. So as things cool down after the PETM, these guys are showing up. And then, um, the most uh, interesting group to me are, the, are, are these guys 
who, they're present and fairly common during the last 100,000, couple hundred thousand years, and in fact, most of them uh, during the last million years before the PETM. They're also present in the Bighorn Basin after the PETM, but we never find them during this, uh, the body of the, of the carbon isotope excursion in the period of most of warmest climate. Some of them start to come into the area again during the recovery phase. So um, these guys are missing uh, in action, as it were, during this part. And what I'm going to do now is just give you a sense of what some of these things look like, and they're going to be color-coded. Uh, the text will be color-coded by these different uh, categories. Um, so um, here are fossils of a couple of species in the, um, the, the group of plants that includes dogwoods. A lot of you might be familiar with dogwoods. That It's a, a, a kind of plant that uh, grows in, in relatively seasonal climates in the northern hemisphere today. And um, these are among um, the, the kinds of plants that we think go extinct um, at, the, at the PETM. And that's true of actually several of them, not just things that are related to dogwood, but the other groups that go extinct are groups that are related to plants today that live in relatively uh, seasonal climates. Sometimes warm seasonal, relative, like sort of coast of Georgia type climates, sometimes uh, colder climates than that. Here's a, a little a grouping of, of plants that come from uh, only the PETM. And here, they're all, these are all in the, the bean family, the Fabaceae. And this is a family that is particularly diverse and particularly abundant in dry tropical forests today. And a couple of these uh, species uh, we're actually starting to nail down to what uh, genus of, of uh, Fabaceae they are. And they are uh, plants that grow in dry tropical forests from, say, Costa Rica to Paraguay. Uh, today. So um, we think that what we're seeing here among the immigrants is, a, is the signature of the northward movement of plants that like uh, dry tropical climates. When we look at the plants that come in after the event's over, so these are the ones that were not present in the Paleocene, but they are present um, after the PTM or in the very latest part of the PTM. Once again, we're looking at, at groups of, of plants that are um, that grow in relatively seasonal climates today. So uh, members of the hickory family, alders, uh, the linden family, and this climbing fern uh, called ligodium that's, that's pretty common in temperate uh, climates today. So again, not, not the warm signature, but more um, an indication that we're looking at a climate that's, that's probably mild, but has some uh, temperature seasonality. And it's also relatively wet. And if we look at the plants that are extirpated, that, that have a gap in their, in their temporal range, uh, we see, again, the same thing. So we've got members of the oak family, the birch family, uh, the sycamore family, a couple of them, uh, ginkgos. Uh, this is something called katsura tree, which grows in Japan today, and dawn redwood, all of which um, they like relatively warm climates for the most part. They get into fairly seasonal, fairly cold climates uh, particularly in the case of, of birches, but um, they, they're not big on, on very warm or hot uh, tropical or dry climates. So these guys are, are missing from the PETM. So what we think we're, what we're the, the most sort of logical explanation for this pattern of change through um, time in the flora is that uh, with the onset of the PETM, the climate warms rapidly and our uh, sampling position here in the Bighorn Basin, uh, the plants are basically moving northward. Um, they're dispersing northward. Uh, of course, they don't move. Individual plants don't move, but, but they, can, they can shed their seeds, and if the seeds uh, succeed uh, in a more northerly part of the range, then, then you get a change in the, in the distribution of the species. And they're, they're showing up in places like the Bighorn Basin when formerly they would have occupied uh, um, areas farther to the south. And some of them, we think, are getting all the way up into the Arctic. And once they're there, during the warmest part of the event, they are moving between the northern continents. Um, in this reconstruction, uh, at the particular time that was chosen 
by the person who did the reconstruction, there's, um, there, there are water gaps across the North uh, the Arctic region, but we are pretty sure based on the biogeography on the, the um, similarity of faunas in, in Europe and North America and Asia that there, were, there was a fair amount of communication from time to time. So we think that, that these, that during the, the height of the PTM, it's possible for plants and animals to get across uh, from one continent to another. And then as the event wanes and the climate cools, um, basically they're being pushed farther south again. So this is what would explain the reappearance of these cooler climate forms in the Bighorn Basin um, as, the, as the PETM uh, fades away, and also probably explains why we have new kinds of plants, the alders and the, and the hickory relatives that show up are actually plants that didn't live in North America. They lived either in Europe or in Asia before the event, and they show up in North America um, at this, at the latitude of the Bighorn Basin because it's gotten cool enough for them to live there. So in ju it's just a sort of summary of what, of what we see. With the onset of the event, we, we are seeing this local to regional extirpation of the temperate deciduous forms, things like the dawn redwood, the birches, the sycamores, uh, the katsuras, and we're seeing the immigration from the south of the bean family and other uh, sorts of dry tropical plants. Um, at the end of the event, basically, the, the situation reverses itself. The, the dry tropical plants that had established in the Bighorn Basin are going locally. They're being locally extirpated. Um, and the old guard, the natives, if you will, are coming back in from the north or from up in the mountains or wherever they survive the event. Um, and the amount of extinction that's associated with the whole fluctuation in climate is actually not huge. I mean, 10% extinction is nothing to laugh about, but it's, it's not a, cat, a cat catastrophic mass extinction on the order of what happens at the end of the age of dinosaurs or other big mass extinctions in the history of, of the planet. And just to give you a sense of, of how it might have looked, this is uh, a, an artist's reconstruction of uh, the late Paleocene with ginkgos and uh, funny little uh, distant relatives of primates and champsosaurs, which are, look like alligators a bit or gavials, but are not, and um, things like that. And then during the PETM, a sort of more dry tropical look and also the appearance of new new kinds of mammals, and then it gets wetter again and <laughs> cooler again in the early part of the Eocene. So you might think, okay, well that, that's an interesting story of, of how plants shift with a major global warming event, but it's not just the plants that are changing. Uh, we actually see the effects of this climate change kind of moving up uh, the trophic chain, if you will. And one of the, the most um, sort of clever and interesting ways that that's done is by looking at uh, fossilized bug bites on fossil leaves, which is what you're looking at here. Uh, I think you probably can see this uh, hole in this leaf with a dark rim around it. There's another one. This one's uh, full of holes. And what those holes represent are um, insects that have chewed a hole in the leaf while the leaf was on the tree. And we know that because this dark rim here is uh, a callus tissue, basically like a scar tissue that plants form when they're damaged by insects. And if you go out this spring later and take a look at leaves, you will I, you know, look very long and you will find leaves that have been, have been eaten by insects and that have formed that callus tissue. So um, several years ago, uh, a student um, did a project uh, looking at the abundance of insect damage on fossil leaves during this climate change and found a very large increase in the frequency of insect damage on leaves. So along with the, um, along with the, the change in the kinds of plants that were there, there was also a big increase in the rate of, of insects feeding on those plants. And there are a couple of reasons why that might be. First of all, 
warmer climate generally goes with a more diverse uh, insect fauna and also with uh, maybe uh, higher year-round populations of insects. But also, it's uh, been observed in greenhouse studies that plants that grow in a high CO2 atmosphere actually make less protein because they, um, they don't need to make as much protein to carry out photosynthesis. And so they, they're basically um, less nutritious and, and the insects that are going to live on them need to eat more. So this could be a result of both of those. We also see, looking even higher up the food chain, uh, we see changes in the vertebrate fauna. This is the, the time at which we get the first occurrence of uh, horse relatives, the um, dawn horse, uh, the first odd toed, uh, even toed ungulates, the, the ancestors of sheep and pigs and goats and uh, cattle, and also the first uh, true primates. So there's a big change in the fauna as well, and it's thought that um, these are probably coming across from other continents. So this is, again, part of that story of exchange of faunas and floras uh, that's a consequence of the climate change. Uh, we also see uh, a change in body size, which is, so the, the ordinary horses, this is actually a, uh, a Green River uh, horse specimen, uh, and you can see that they're, they're pretty little animals. Uh, and this is a graph showing uh, th through the PETM, so the, the PETM begins here, and goes up to here. And um, this is actually a, just a measurement of the area of a molar tooth from many specimens. Each of these green diamonds represents a single specimen. And uh, the first horses arrive, as I said, right at the beginning of the PETM. And then they show a progressive decrease in body size uh, through the first part of the event. Uh, they stay small for, for most of the event. And then right as the event starts to wane, they increase in body size. So this is about a 30% decrease in body size that's associated with this much warmer climate and possibly with, with uh, fodder that's less nutritious. So um, there are actually evolutionary changes that are, appear to be forced by the climate change that we're seeing during the PETM. So let's just uh, think about four lessons that we might learn from, from this uh, 56 million year old uh, example of global warming. First of all, um, there's this um, dissolution of carbonate. So if anybody asks you, um, is it really true that adding CO2 to the atmosphere causes the ocean to become more acidic and to dissolve carbonate? The answer is, yeah, we have actually, we have got a really good example of that. Um, we also know that, um, and this is sort of more an emerging part of the science, is that it's, it seems likely that um, whatever kicked off the, the PETM, whatever started the warming, actually resulted in more warming. So the event is not, it's not just a single one-off thing, but rather that there are uh, pools of carbon uh, that are in various places. And you know, this is somewhat um, uh, my favorite idea as opposed to something that we know for sure, but that um, as the climate changes and warms, um, that we actually see feedbacks, positive feedbacks, uh, self-reinforcing cycles that promote more carbon release uh, during the event. So, Warming from one source leads to warming from another, and that's also something that we should be thinking about um, as a possibility in the future. Um, also, this is something that lasts for a long time, so it doesn't go away. You don't, you don't reverse this event quickly. It's something that takes a couple hundred thousand years for the Earth system to work through this big pulse of carbon. And then finally, um, that this rapid global warming changes where plants and animals live, it changes how they interact with one another, and it even drives evolutionary change. So the, the effects of the carbon release are pervasive uh, throughout the biosphere. Um, I think um, it's time for a couple of, uh, of quotes. Um, this is, these are sort of guide words for, for any, any paleontologist. Um, and of course, especially one from the South, you have to have a Faulkner quote. Um, <laughs> the past is never dead, it isn't even past. Um,
And maybe one that's even better, the past is all we know of the future. Now, anyone who's curious about what's going to happen had better understand the history of what has happened. Um, I'm reminded, actually, I, I talked with a, a guy, uh, a Russian guy, who, did, um, who does both ecology and paleoecology. And he's a very imposing you know, sort of character, a big, as you would sort of imagine. He works in Siberia. He's 6'5 and the size of a, of a bear. And, he was, and we were standing around a, at a conference, and somebody said, oh, Yuri, do you prefer to do ecology, or do you prefer to do paleoecology? And Yuri said, paleoecology. Data about the past are very hard to get. Data about the future are impossible. <laughs> so, so a lot of us, a lot of us, you know, look, we look at the past because we can. We know what we can tell what's already happened. Um, but where do we go with this? Um, so, this is a graph that probably a lot of you have seen. This is the this is the annual production of CO2 of carbon. Um, through uh, human emissions in billions of tons, and, and it's something that you know, we're all well aware of, that, that, the, uh, that we're producing more and more uh, carbon, um, putting it into the atmosphere every year. But it's actually, in some ways, not what we should be worried about. Is the, I mean, we have to worry about the year-to-year -year production, but what we should be thinking about uh, harder is the cumulative amount of CO2 that's ended up in the atmosphere, the cumulative amount of carbon. And so I've switched the, the, the vertical axis here. It's still in billions of tons, but now instead of uh, running from 0 to 10 or 12 or whatever that was, it's now uh, representing the total amount of carbon that's ended up in the atmosphere uh, since um, 1750, which is about 384 billion tons. And this is the curve for the annual addition. And the thing that's, that we, in part, have learned from the PETM, but it's also consistent with other information, is that a lot of that carbon is still in the atmosphere. So something like 247 billion tons of what we've added are still there and still having their climatic effect today. Um, this is sort of the overhang of the past, if you will. Um, the past isn't past, really. And that carbon, um, we know not only from these historical examples like the PETM, but also from carbon uh, cycle modeling, that carbon doesn't come out very quickly. So this is a, an experiment uh, from a simulation of the carbon cycle. If you add 5,000 billion tons of carbon to the atmosphere, um, you can see uh, some of it's taken up by vegetation on land, some of it dissolves in the ocean. Uh, we're going out here in um, years, so 200 years later, uh, there's still most of it is still in the atmosphere. Um, 2,000 years later, something like half of it's still in the atmosphere. And 10,000 years later, um, there's still maybe 15 to up to 40 percent of it in the atmosphere. And of course, the consequences of that are that, um, whoops, the consequences are the temperature is going to stay high. So another um, model run showing temperature estimates uh, warming. Uh, out to the year 3000, um, very rapid warming, assuming uh, burning enough carbon to put 7 billion tons a year into the atmosphere, which is less than we're adding now, uh, consumption increase of 2% per year, burn up the whole fossil fuel reservoir, which is 5,000 billion tons, a sort of PETM quantity, and basically the temperature just hangs at a globally elevated 4 to 5 degrees Celsius uh, for the next thousand years. And it, it actually it doesn't go down very much after that um, very quickly. So what we're doing now has this enormously long overhang into the deep future. And that's why we have to start thinking about the future in a much longer term than I think most of us are comfortable or accustomed to doing. This is. Um, a Google Earth image of the south end of Manhattan, and this is uh, an envisioned south end of Manhattan in the year 2100 uh, from a, um, a planning exercise that was done out of the, I think funded by the mayor's office in New York. And 
the, uh, the envisioning, envisioning is uh, of uh, New York with uh, sea level that's two meters higher. And these are floating marshes that are supposed to damp the storm surges that come up um, to the south end of the island. Uh, the buildings here that are in white are buildings that um, have um, bases that are below sea level. So it uh, could be a very different world. Uh, if I'm giving this talk in Washington, I usually try to show this. This is a, a more extreme scenario, but, but if, uh, if we were to continue adding carbon, um, you know, 5,000 years, uh, it's a long time away, but, um, but these things are really hard to stop once they get going. So this is, um, this is Washington uh, with somehow, and only in Washington could this happen, a traffic jam on the 14th Street Bridge, <laughs> even though it's underwater, I don't know. Uh, um, but, and the, the, t the tidal basin has a new meaning um, out in front. Uh, I presume the cherry trees are not doing well. Um, but uh, yeah, huge, huge changes in, in sea level that sort of echo on. And of course, the, the ocean water that's rising is going to be ocean water with um, a lower pH than it has today and consequent effects on the biota. And there are lots of other signs that we're living in this period of time that's really where the environment of the planet is much more defined by humans, which is why a lot of people are starting to call it the Anthropocene. Um, we're generating new kinds of topographies um, that, you know, this is, this is something that, that if there's, a, if intelligent aliens land in uh, 20 million years in the future, they will be able to detect our uh, bioturbation and our trace fossils. Very exciting for them. Um, uh, we're modifying the nitrogen cycle, so um, most of the, of the reactive nitrogen that uh, makes up um, the bodies of organisms, the proteins of organisms that makes up your bodies, most of it now is made by humans. It's not nitrogen from the natural nitrogen cycle. It's actually, you know, you can think of like 40% of the proteins in my body actually were made by human beings, which is a kind of profound thought. And that's, that's allowed huge changes in um, the distribution of biomass. So um, this is a, a wonderful cartoon from a, a website that is beloved by science nerds the world over called XKCD. And um, this is, these blocks represent uh, a million tons of biomass. And this is um, the biomass of all the land mammals on the surface of the planet, of which uh, we compose this much. And our uh, livestock compose the pink part here. And that's 97% of the biomass of terrestrial mammals. So uh, the food chain is pretty well altered by what we're doing. And uh, you may have, when you were in school, or if you were recently in school, you may have recently seen a biome map of the, of, of the planet. You know, what, you know, tropical forest biome, dry tropical forest biome, temperate forest biome, grassland biome, uh, Tyaga, uh, tundra, and so forth. Well, um, people are now starting to think about anthromes, as they call them, although I think anthropogenic biomes is a little easier to understand. Um, that you know, none of these kinds of natural biomes are really unaltered by humans, and that we should be thinking about mapping, um, in addition to the, quote, natural vegetation, we should be thinking about mapping um, anthropogenic biomes. Um, so you can see you know, a lot of village biomes, uh, crop areas, and um, only something like 23% of the, of the biome, of the um, area of the Earth, of terrestrial Earth, could really be called even sort of uh, wild in any sense. Um, most of it is modified or heavily modified by humans. And then there's the problem of, of extinction. Um, we are, um, these white icons show where we are now uh, in terms of extinction in a series of, of groups of animals. So a lot of these numbers are down around 1%. There are a few that are up closer to 10%. Um, and these black uh, figures here show where, uh, if you include all of the uh, threatened uh, species in the extinction toll, assuming that, that we lose them, we might uh, get up into this sort of uh, between 
40, 30, 40, 50% range in, in a number of groups. We're still pretty far short of the, the giant mass extinctions, the five biggest mass extinctions in the history of the planet, but um, we're losing a lot of species. Um, and then there's also biotic globalization, just the mixing of species. Uh, so we're having, we're having a big impact just by mixing faunas and floras from around the world. There are a lot of places in the world where you know, somewhere between 20 and 50% and of the plant species are actually not from there. And uh, of course, we assist in the migration of these things, um, even when they are uh, cute cat photos from the internet. We're, we're still helping these guys move around the world. Um, and we're even causing, um, either intentionally or unintentionally, uh, the kind of evolution of new kinds of organisms. Uh, some of them are pretty exotic. Uh, some of them are actually quite common, like this Roundup Ready corn. And some of them are completely unintentional. There's a new uh, species of mosquito in the London tube um, that is diverged from its above ground ancestors as recently as uh, probably 40 or 50 years ago. Okay, so what I'm, but what I want to argue here at the very end is that, um, that this kind of perspective, this kind of earth history perspective actually helps. Um, it's not just a litany of woes. It's not, just, um, it's not just all the things that are wrong with the planet. It's also a way of getting out of, of this situation. Um, so I, I feel that there's, um, there's actually um, a very unhealthy kind of debate. And um, what I've done here is just to choose a couple of cartoons that I think they, they may symbolize end members, but, um, but I think they're significant end members. And uh, this is the, the sort of uh, conservative's view of environmentalists with, with Al Gore um, as the, the priestly figure who's exhorting people to recycle and, and so forth. And, uh, and I think the, the message that is trying to get being, that's trying to be um, gotten across by this cartoonist is that environmentalists value nature more than they do people. And this is the, the, the flip side, um, which is someone who wants you to think that, that businesses value money more than people. And the message of both is that people aren't really as important as something else. Um, the Anthropocene perspe perspective basically says that the Earth has always changed. Um, there is no state of nature that's stable. There never was. And furthermore, that we've already changed the Earth very substantially. We've started changing it um, thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of years ago. Um, and that there's no way of getting back. So if the goal of conservation is to somehow return the planet to a pristine, wild, and correct state, the game's over already. So we should probably stop thinking of it that way. We, have, we can only go forward. Uh, and we might want to go forward, and I think most people would think we want to go forward with the least um, loss of diversity, of biological diversity. We don't want the environment to change rapidly, more rapidly than we can cope with it. Um, but we can discuss the severity and the rate and the scale of those changes without becoming apocalyptic. So the end is not near. When you have seven billion individuals in your species and you're headed to nine, you are not in danger of going extinct. You know, but, but how often do you hear someone say, yeah, probably casually, but you know, the words mean something. Uh, they say, we're going to kill ourselves. We're going to drive ourselves extinct. I don't think so. I think we're you know, a good bet for survival. The question is, how uncomfortable are we going to be? How many of the, the resources that come from three and a half billion years of evolution on this planet are we going to keep with us? Not, are we going to kill ourselves off? could happen, but it seems very unlikely. Um, and the, what kind of goes with that is this, this acceptance of a very middle-aged sort of point of view, <laughs> which is that, you know, we just have to kind of be calm about this. We have to accept the fact that we're in the business of managing the planet. We can't manage it back to the past. It doesn't go that way. Um, 
And we can't ignore the fact that we're having these huge effects. We have to figure out what we're going to do. And so um, I, I have a, a sort of symbol, which is in partly in honor of being at the Leonardo, um, which, which uh, um, you know, the Vitruvian man is, is supposed to be a symbol of balance. And uh, so somewhere between uh, this apocalyptic view of, of killing off everything, which I think is, is not accurate and not helpful, and complacency where we ignore um, what we're doing, and denial where we say there is no global warming, there is, you know, none of this is a problem. We have to find ourselves somewhere in the middle. Um, and that that's really what the Anthropocene means. The, the history of life on this planet has never had a purpose. It evolves, it happens, but we have a purpose. And so, you know, I think we, we need to kind of accept that and, and move forward thinking in, in a way that is, that recognizes the severity of the problems that we might cause and plans ahead and says, we have to start thinking way down the pike. We have to start thinking a little bit more like geologists. Um, and um, I think that's, that's really what the, the message of the Anthropocene is. So thanks very much. And I, I don't know exactly what the tradition here is, but I guess people who need to go should go, and people who want to ask questions, I'll, I'll be happy to answer questions. Yeah. No, we're, we are, we think that the, the PETM warming we think is the result of you know, probably at least 4,000 uh, billion tons of carbon and we're 300 and, or maybe closing in on 400 billion tons. So we're still you know, 10 times less, but we also are adding it much, much faster. And the consequences of really rapid uh, carbon addition to the ocean and atmosphere are quite different because the systems that, um, that sort of um, adapt to that, both the biological systems and also the geochemical systems, are really um, sensitive to the, to the rate of addition as well as to the magnitude. Yes? Um, could you explain a little more about what happened at the discovery? Um, I, I hope I, a little bit, <laughs> at least. Um, so, um, this, is, this is a difficult question to answer in this audience because Gabe Bowen, who introduced me and who was um, born after I started college, actually knows way more about this than I do. But I'll, um, uh, we, we think that the, that the period of rapid recovery of the carbon isotope composition is probably rapid in part because it's reflecting the it's reflecting basically photosynthesis. So plants are drawing down CO2 from the atmosphere, um, but the, the, they prefer using the light isotope of carbon. So they're sucking more carbon-12 atoms out of the atmosphere than they are carbon-13, which causes the isotope curve to bend faster than the CO2 curve. We don't have a CO2 curve. We're working on that, but we don't have one yet for the event. Um, but the, then there's a very long tail where the isotopic composition um, recovers back to its previous uh, state over quite a long period of time. And that's probably um, the re result of weathering processes. So there's a, a sort of geochemical side of it and a biological side of it. And those are together in some combination what's pulling the CO2 out of the atmosphere. Did I see somebody in here? Yeah. Um, can you talk about how during the PETM, um, climates that were normally cold went a lot warmer? What about climates that were like near to the equator that began as really warm? Yeah. Did they become so hot that they're compatible or is that? So we, we've, um, a lot of people have been looking for good records across this event 
in the tropics. And it's been very hard to find. Um, a friend of mine who works at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, is, who's um, Colombian, spent, has spent a lot of decades. He's almost as um, stubborn as I am when it comes to finding PETM fossils, looking for sections in northern South America that would have been at a tropical latitude at that time. And it's really hard, hasn't found very many. There's one record. Um, unfortunately, it's, a, it's, a, it's, in, um, it's of pollen and spores only, so no, no other kinds of fossils. And it's in marine sediments that were near the northern edge of South America. So the record is probably a little bit mixed in time. So the pollen grains are not being deposited in a way that lets you do a very fine reconstruction. And he doesn't actually see that big a change. There's sort of an, there's actually, as you're going into the Eocene, there's an increase in diversity, um, but not a strong signature of biotic change during the event. Um, so we, we, as far as terrestrial organisms are concerned, we, we're pretty sure there's not a mass extinction of tropical plants, for instance, just because we think we would see that in, in a major difference uh, before and after the event, which we do have some record of. Um, but we don't really, we haven't been able to refine that yet. And certainly one of the things we most want to know is, is you know, where it was already as warm as it was anywhere on the planet, what happens when you increase the temperature another five degrees Celsius? Um, and of course, that, that has implications for what happens with tropical forests today. But we, we just don't know the answer. Yeah. We, we re yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting question that we, that we don't have the answer to yet. In the, in the pollen record in the neotropics, which is the, the place where in, the, in basically uh, Colombia and Venezuela, um, there is this sort of fairly steep increase in the diversity of pollen types in the two to four million years following the PETM, where we have some reasonably good records. Um, so it looks as if um, diversity is, is responding well to whatever happened, you know, before, I mean, it, it's, it's, there's a recovery, if you will, or an increase in diversity. Um, but we don't, again, we don't have, the, we don't have a, a, a finely resolved record, and that's really the hard, when you're studying a, a kind of per, a short, per, geologically short perturbation like this, you're, what you're really trying to do is, is like get out the microscope and look at a relatively short period of time, just a few hundred thousand years. Um, and what we have instead are records that kind of let us reconstruct what happened from, from, you know, from this two million year long period to the next two million long, year long period. So it's very fuzz, a very fuzzy record in time. Yeah. So your work shows that uh, during the PETM, plants shifted around a little bit and didn't grow at the south, and, but they did okay. Um, we're pushing the climate Well, I think that, because, again, because of the rate of change, um, there's much higher potential for um, plants, to, for species to go extinct. Um, during, if, if, um, if the PETM happened very rapidly in a few thousand years, it might actually have exceeded the potential for um, plants to disperse and increase their range. Um, so it's possible that we could be looking at rates of change at the short end, at the, at the high end, that would, that would exceed sort of normal dispersal and, and um, establishment of new populations as a way of responding. Um, but we don't really know that yet. So uh, even if it was a few thousand years to go from pre to full PETM conditions, it's, you know, we're probably going to do something like that in a few hundred years, so 10 times faster. I think the only the only way to deal with it is by what some people call assisted migration. 
So I don't think, and this is you know a kind of a, a little bit of a hot button issue with a lot of conservationists. They say, well, you can't introduce alien species to a to a place where they don't belong. And you know you're thinking, yeah, but we're we're basically taking the climate they live in and moving it somewhere else. So we either have to accept that they're going to go extinct, or we have to put them where they need to be, um, which is certainly a cost of doing business that we should be considering when we're thinking about good reasons to not cause the climate to change so fast. So um, I think that, yeah, I think that the rate is really key. And I, I think the, the rate that we're likely to experience in the next centuries is, is way faster and therefore um, probably going to be a lot harder for, for organisms to deal with. Yes. Yeah, there, there, this is something that, that's actually you know, particularly relevant to people who live or whose descendants will live in the middle of a continent, um, is that we, what we're seeing um, in several places in the Rockies um, across this time interval appears to be um, basically uh, much greater fluctuations in rainfall. So it sometimes manifests itself as uh, what appears to be drought adaptation in the plants. So we see plants with smaller leaves that seem to do better in drier climates. But we also see um, in some of the shapes of the, of the um, river channel rocks, we see indications of increased flow. So it looks as if when, it, when, there, were, when there were rainstorms, it, there were really heavy rainstorms, big channels, deep channels, high rates of flow. And then when it wasn't raining, it was stressing the plants um, in between. So, and this is, com this is also something that is predicted to, to happen uh, with, with global warming in the future. So it's a case where we're beginning to get evidence from the distant past that's consistent with the, with the projections that come out of uh, climate models. Yes? Well, I'm Yeah, the, the extinction rates that, that were um, on that slide are coming, you know, they're just basically saying what's already extinct and what's on the, on the endangered and threatened species list. So you're, you're basically saying these populations are known to be in trouble and we're assuming that they're just gonna, gonna um, go extinct. Um, so it's not explicitly modeling things like urbanization. But you know, urbanization may be a very good thing. Um, if you concentrate human populations in smaller areas, uh, you leave more of the landscape in a, in a state where it could support some of the biodiversity that we would like it to support. So you know, urban centers are actually more efficient in energy use than rural areas. Um, so there, there are actually some you know, I, I think this is one of the things about people who are thinking hard about the Anthropocene is that there's some kind of unexpected results and that, you know, that we need to keep our minds open to, to how we actually negotiate this the next, you know, hundreds of years or thousands of years. Oh, I'm getting a signal that one more question and we had, I, we started with somebody down here, so. The, the, uh, this is not a subject about which I am deeply expert, but the latest um, IPCC report from last year um, downplays the 
likelihood of that happening anytime soon. So if you warm things enough and it stays, the temperatures stay elevated for a very long time, like it's conceivable that, that methane clathrates could, could um, be destabilized and, and end up in the atmosphere. But um, the planet is actually starting from quite a cold state right now because of being in a, in a longer glacial um, age. And um, so it's a little harder to mobilize the clathrates. And people, I think, are probably more concerned about uh, methane from permafrost and other sources than they are about uh, clathrates in the ocean. So I think, what? Yeah.